Hey everybody, Matt Carter here with Parkbench, and today I'm here at Aeolian Hall. I'm here with Clark Bryan, he's the executive director here, so thanks for joining me today. It's a pleasure. Awesome, so I, I, we'll just start off by giving everybody a little idea about um, what Aeolian Hall is and what you kind of do for the, uh, the company here. Sure. Um, we don't usually call ourselves a company. Okay. Uh, we're more of a, a movement, I would say, like a social movement. We're a, a nonprofit charity that tries to, uh, through music, um, make change. So uh, we're all about changing access to music, um, to music education, and uh, through that, uh, trying to make uh, community change. So excellent. So. I mean, this building has been around for quite a while now. You can kind of tell by the architecture and the feel of the building once you walk in. Um, so can you give us a brief history of the building and maybe its previous uses? And Sure, yeah. Um, so when this building was built as the Town Hall for East London, it was actually um, a separate city. So the city boundary at the time was Adelaide Street. And to this day, if you go to student services at the University of Western Ontario, or Western University it's called now, uh, you will be told to, well, they'll take a map and they'll draw a line down Adelaide Street and say don't go east of Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> I've challenged them on this. I, I've challenged the administration. They're like, no, we don't do that. And then every graduate level class or undergraduate that comes in here, oh yes, I went through that. <laughs> uh, but the the it's so it's a very old kind of um, dividing line, right, between two separate kind of communities. And this community on the east side was um, the railroad. The railroad. Um, uh, what do they call them? Where they work on the on the uh, the uh, the locomotives and so forth, uh, and then there were oil refineries. So a lot of sort of blue collar <coughs> workers out on the side of the city, and um, so they were trying to finish their waterworks, and they had this big plan to build this hall, and um, the hall went over budget. Uh, which happens in every century, uh, and uh, um, they uh, didn't have enough money to finish their waterworks, so they ended up uh, joining the main city. So there was a, a vote, a municipal vote, it was held at this town hall. I've even found a ballot in the wall oh, for wow. it, and, uh, and that was that. So the main city owned the hall at that point. So I think it was just over a year that it, uh, from about 1884 to 1885, it was uh, the town hall for this, uh, this separate city, East London. And uh, so the uh, main city took it over until 1946. So during that time, um, it was used for all kinds of things. So for example, um, the first branch of the London Public Library was exactly where we're sitting. Oh wow. So these front rooms in, in the hall on the main floor uh, from about 1915-ish to about 1928 was the first branch of wow. the London Public Library. Uh, so there's a free press article about that and a beautiful picture. Uh, and uh, so uh, just all kinds of different things that happened in here. There was a school of telegraphy, a regular public school. Um, the Odd Fellows met upstairs. Um, and there was a fire station just behind these walls over oh, here. Wow. Uh, fire station number two. So it was here till 1946 and it was here from the very beginning. A multi-purpose facility basically. Yeah. And the firemen used to sleep at the very back. Okay, uh, and they had a soccer club, and so just next to the hall was a soccer field wow. uh, for a long time. And uh, so the um, firemen apparently used to go upstairs on a Saturday night and dance in the hall, <laughs> right? And yeah. they would have like a, a band or an orchestra for that. Um, but a really interesting event happened uh, in the history of the hall in 1927. And, um, People came from all over the place for the very first convention in Canada of the NAACP. Okay. So the Nas National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Oh, wow. So this was in Canada, the very first one on the stage. Wow. Why? We haven't figured that out yet. Um, as a matter of fact, the history of that event was not well known in London until probably about seven or eight years ago when they discovered the prospectus for it in the digital archives of the New York Public Library. 
And so there's this beautiful uh, prospectus showing all the names of the people and their biographies who came. Um, and the front cover of it, which is on the wall over there, uh, uh, shows, you know, Aeolian Town Hall, or sorry, East London Town Hall uh, was at that point. And uh, there's a review of that night that says basically, one would have thought one was in New York City. Everybody came dressed up to the nines and there was an orchestra on stage yeah. and there were tables and they ate and they danced. Wow. And uh, so um, interesting to note that we still do those kinds of events yeah. here. Yeah. Um, but um, it's a piece of, of heritage with the under, Underground Railway and all of the uh, progressive human rights uh, things that were going on in Canada during this time, um, right here in this village. That's right? amazing. It's, it's something to be very proud of, I think. Yeah. And something to share um, that we are, the, we are a village of firsts in many yeah. ways. Yeah. Um, so so after it was sold, the hall was sold, um, it went into a whole series of different owners. And this room where we're sitting was um, uh, a radio shop where they okay. sold ra radios and repaired them for a long time. Mm -hmm. There was a shoe repair out the back uh, where the firemen used to live. Just lots of different things. I think it even at the, where the fire trucks parked, there was a, a kind of a garage. Uh, repair um, and then the hall upstairs was used for a lot of different things but um, the last tenant uh, before this rich millionaire bought it in 1967 was a furniture warehouse so there's okay. a free press uh, picture of you know those car lot streamers that you see with the pendants yeah, on them yeah. so they were <laughs> strung all over the the ceiling of the hall and there's this poor little couch Right before you get on the stage, um, they had all this furniture up there uh, before this guy bought it. So very sad state of disrepair at that point. Apparently the attic in the place had, uh, you know, a couple of feet of um, pigeon doodle in, in it. And uh, so enter Mr. Gordon Jeffrey in 1967-ish. Uh, um, Gordon was a son of the London Life Insurance Company okay. owners. He was a lawyer, so he did the legal work. Yep. Um, they had a lot of money, a I'd lot <laughs> of money. And so before this hall became known as Aeolian Hall, there was another Aeolian Hall. Oh, wow. If you go down towards uh, the YMCA downtown, mm -hmm. um, there's a group of tall apartment buildings called London Towers. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of that, you'll see a church tower. And that church tower is all that's left of the original Aeolian Hall. Oh, wow. It was a, an old church that um, Gordon had fit up uh, from the 1940s until the, the big fire in 1967-ish. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it was arson and that, that place was uh, giving concerts and uh, had teaching studios in the, in the lower level. And even the most famous Canadian musician of all time, Glenn Gould, performed there. So uh, once the fire happened, he moved over here as a temporary space as he was building a concert hall on top of one of the London Towers. Oh, wow. Okay. So he put about $600,000 into this place in 1967, which today would be like 2.5 million yeah, at least, yeah. right? And um, shored it all up with steel, um, like you can see <laughs> on the ceilings, all these areas where you see covered steel beams, uh, replaced the roof, um, took out the, the ceiling with all the pigeon doo-doo on, on it, and uh, put a big organ up on the balcony, um, concert organ, and uh, opened up doing classical music. Uh, he was a classical music, he was kind of an amateur organist, semi-professional semi organist, organist really. And um, so he owned the hall and it was kind of only used wasn't used that regularly, a lot for classical music. So only very few people knew about it during mm -hmm. that time period. And um, he died in 1986, was left to a trust to run for 20 years. And then I came along in 2004 in a midlife crisis and bought it. <laughs> and uh, I was, I'm a concert pianist and I wanted to get off the road. 
thought I would start a music school. And so I sold my house, bought it, moved in, lived in the back where the firemen oh, are. Oh, wow. And uh, actually, this was my studio for a long time, teaching studio and uh, performance studio. And um, uh, in 2009, I made it into a charity um, so that it would continue um, in this model. And um, we... Um, yeah, there's lots to talk about yeah. from, from my tenure, but essentially, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, I, I went from wanting to run a music school to somebody who saw the stresses on the streets in the early days and wanted to make a difference through what I'm doing here with that. Yeah. So today, one of the things we do that I think has a very high impact is run a free after-school music program for disadvantaged children. Um, and um, we have uh, about 130 in orchestras and choirs. They sang in the Junos this year. Um, absolutely free. We feed them a meal. And um, that's one of the ways that we try to... Uh, to invest in our community mm -hmm. and to make some some change, giving giving everybody the the right to have um, uh, access to a good music education is yeah. is part of our vision. Yeah, absolutely, that's amazing. And I mean, it's you went through all that history. It's amazing how many things have been through here, how long this building has been here, and just how the city's kind of grown around it and utilized it in so many ways and it's contributed so much exactly. to like I, the I, growth. One of the things I remember uh, is a woman coming by here saying that like during the war time, they used to come up to the balcony level here to get so, like the food stamps, right? Oh, wow. You know, for, yeah. so people have had a lot of interaction with this space and um, uh, we're, we're so happy to see it continue to be part of the mm -hmm. community. Yeah, that's amazing. So we talked a lot about uh, the last, last 150 years or so of the, of the building. So what do you, what do you think's in store for the future of uh, Alien Hall? Wow, that's a that's a difficult it question. Maybe a very it's a broad very, question, very, right? very but. broad one. So, so we right now, um, you know, we do artistic presentation. So obviously, we want to continue to do that to mm -hmm. inspire Londoners. And one of the things I really try to do is to look for things that are, you know, may not necessarily be presented by other presenters in mm -hmm. town. Um, like bringing in, for example, the Vienna Boys Choir or Chick Corea, one of the greatest jazz performers, or someone like Buffy St. Marie, who is such a social activist. Um, just looking for ways to broaden experience through that uh, presentation. So that's something we want to continue to evolve. Um, we want to see more women on our stage. We, we made a big conscious effort in the last two years to try and balance that out because yep. the music industry has been a man's territory yep. for a long time. Uh, and um, we are really um, happy to be supporting as well uh, various other communities. Um, and um, this last year, for example, I brought Jeremy Dutcher in, uh, who won the Polaris Prize on the Juno, uh, an Indigenous performer who's, I think, one of the greatest ones we have in Canada today. Yep. Um, so, so that's a that's a facet. Um, we have this children's program that I mentioned. Uh, the kids are up to age 18 now in that program, but uh, we want to continue to expand that and offer that opportunity to more kids. We also have a men's chorus, so it's called Pride Men's Chorus London. Mm -hmm. In many parts of the world it would be called a gay men's chorus, but we have men from all different identities in it. So there are straight men, there are transgendered men, uh, and um, in the summertime, we actually open up the choir to women as well. Okay. So we had 80 in a chorus uh, this oh, wow. summer. Uh, it was really remarkable. And that choir is, um, you know, it's really about singing out and changing uh, hearts and minds. So just trying to give a different kind of um, perspective on diversity mm -hmm. and through song, hoping to get people to open up to the idea that diversity is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been um, an interesting side effect that the people who have become part of that chorus are actually um, formed like a little 
club or brotherhood or whatever you want to yeah. call it that they were looking to come out of some in many cases isolation or um, ostracization a lot of some sometimes people you know lose their families when they come out yeah. right um, and so it's it's serving this whole other piece that we we didn't really anticipate mm -hmm. in terms of the the social aspect um, we also have a professional chamber orchestra um, that is a teaching orchestra model and uh, do art shows here and um, we have a talk series called Aeolian Talks which are we're kind of um, working with that uh, model and trying to get uh, inspiring ideas on our stage mm -hmm. we'll be covering the election this year with yeah. that which is going to be very interesting yeah. um, we uh, we want to do more programming we want to um, my vision uh, uh, as the artistic director is to actually um, using the uh, children's program mm -hmm. as a model create other educational opportunities that allow access um, to a rich education. So our education system right now has huge disparagency. Yes. You go to some schools, they have everything, and you go to some and they have nothing. Yep. And yet we're supposed to be this socialist democracy that has a level playing field. We don't. Yeah. We do not. Yeah. So if you're born into uh, you know, a certain social class and a school in a certain neighborhood, don't expect to have an orchestra in your school. It's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. And, <laughs> and so uh, we feel this is really terrible on so yeah. many levels. It's not only um, it's classism, right? Okay. Um, which we don't talk about much in our culture, but we have huge classism in our culture. But it's also creating a paradigm where people who do without these things don't feel part of the community gotcha yeah. so you know you can see some end results of that as to what's going on in south of the border right now mm -hmm. we have people who you know live in inner cities and aren't getting the education or the opportunities resenting people who are on this other yeah. paradigm where they're born into to money and opportunity we have to stop this yeah. or we're gonna we're gonna go completely like that yeah. right um, so that's um, that's gonna drive us I think to um, to launch programs that will will help with with that issue um, we're holding on to two heritage buildings right now there's this one and we also have a long-term lease on the Bishop Cronin Memorial Church okay. which had to close uh, 1875 huge facility bigger than this one yeah and uh, for us, heritage <coughs> buildings um, hold this story mm -hmm. of who we are, mm -hmm. right? And if we lose them, it's you can tell the story, but it's not the same as feeling and touching and experiencing. And so for us, um, being able to preserve and to continue to restore these buildings is a really big thing. Like I'd love to get the cupola back on the tower here. Mm -hmm. There was a gorgeous Victorian oh, cupola that, on the that tower. Would be great to yeah, and lots of it, yeah. lots of detail. There like there was a balcony over the front doors. Yeah. These windows used to go to the ceiling here. Yeah. There's covered over carvings, um, some of the oh, windows. Man on the second Just floor it all restored back to original would be amazing well and and you know with the amount of work that's been done in revitalization in this area the mm -hmm. east village i think it would be something like um, equivalent to let's get put the crown back on the the, the grand dame yeah. right like let's 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 show people that we can um, through our strong will and vision make this neighborhood the place that we all dream of living in yeah it's well on its way but yeah. we still have challenges absolutely yeah absolutely and i think it's amazing you speak of all the the programs you have and and the community outreach that you have going on and uh, I, I feel like a lot of people may um, see alien hall just uh, if they're not familiar with it as as a music hall yeah. more or less and there's just so much more to um to everything in this building it's very difficult to market what I, we do absolutely right? and I like think that to might tell be that story exactly. so this has been a great opportunity for us to to, to speak with you today one of the other <laughs> things that uh, people don't realize is that um, we have 5.5 full-time positions to hold this all together yeah and the rest of it is like over 150 <coughs> volunteers and that volunteer community is remarkable beyond belief yeah some of them have been here as many as 14 years uh, we actually have 
have now a program uh, with uh, a number of leaders in the volunteer uh, group to um, do outreach to aging volunteers mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah. we see this as a problem. They get isolated and they've been with us. They're part of our community. We need to try and look after them if we can, you know. Um, but the volunteerism uh, is, is a remarkable part of what we do, that people are willing to roll up their sleeves and work towards something that uh, benefits everybody, right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And um, while we're speaking of all these programs, I'm, um, the hall still puts on many shows um, throughout the, the year. I mean, I'm, yeah. from the looks of it in your uh, box office, there's not a, a lack of anything going on here with shows it's available. It's very busy. It's very busy. Yeah. So um, what's uh, sort of kind of switching gears here a little bit, but uh, what sort of shows do you have coming up in the next little while that people can oh, look wow. forward to? I hate this question yeah. because <laughs> I'm so like the guy in the back room right now half the time just, you know, uh, trying to bring in the resources so we can keep going and uh, thinking about the development part. But uh, with that said, um, you know, we have um, a lot of the, the CBC singer-songwriter set coming back again this year. So you'll see familiar names. Um, we're actually looking right now at bringing um, uh, Basha Bulat back. We haven't had her here for years. And of course, uh, um, we have the Good Lovelies back for Christmas concerts Perfect. and Royal Wood and things like that. Um, on the classical side, um, I. I want to do a lot more uh, and we do have some things I can't talk about yet with that. On the jazz side, uh, we have we start out our season with uh, Carol Wellsman, who's one yeah. of the like she is one of the greatest jazz vocalists and pianists out there today. Um, and she unfortunately lives in Los Angeles now, but she's <laughs> Canadian and she um, she was schooled here. Um, so uh, that will be a remarkable one for people to see. But we've started this little series in this room actually, mm -hmm. and it's really designed to um, to help us raise money to restore the facilities. Um, we realize we need to now start to funnel a, a, a quite a bit of money towards that. You know, after 130, 140, 160 years, uh, that's Bishop Cronin, <clears throat> You, your brickwork needs pointing and yep. all those things, you know, you have to think about roofs and so on. So uh, we, we kicked off, I did the first concert here uh, and uh, we were selling out every single one of them. It's only 40 to 50 seats, depending on how we configure. Um, but we have, um, Sarah Smith just did one last night and uh, uh, we have Sonia Gustafsson next week. Uh, and the week after that, uh, Julie Haggerty is coming in and we, we are launching like at least two a month in here, which it's gotcha. it's a very unique opportunity to be very up close and personal with an artist. Yeah. And even my friend Yuri Poole has has offered to do one to help. Like he's, awesome. he's but he never does solo yeah. now. And he plays these huge theaters in the United States for like 60,000 people. Um, but he would really like to contribute that way. So look for that. That's yeah. going to be a really interesting facet of what we do. Yeah, and it's it's super interesting because this is a really intimate setting in here, whereas opposed to your, your large hall where um, that where all the shows that I've seen here have been in the larger hall. And That's right, yeah. It's, it's, it's an amazing show, but this is just a different experience altogether mm -hmm. with uh, being so close up and personal with and this lovely little bar that you guys can't see bar. right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, and we have a patio that we open uh, on the side with an enclosed garden as well oh, in the, in the better nice. better uh, weather so people mix and mingle at intermission and that's, so on. That's yeah. amazing. So um, kind of circling back, I guess, to um, when you took um, this building over and, and you've worked here for about, uh, it's been about 15 years 15 now? years. 15 years. So 15 that's amazing. Years, July 29th. So congratulations on that. Thank that's you. amazing. Thank that's, you. Um, but what is is your favorite thing about working uh, here? Wow. Um, Asking the hard-hitting questions. <laughs> yeah, I would say, you know, I lose a lot of sleep <laughs> worrying about things. And there have been times, you know, um, I'm happy to talk about this where I've thought, I, can I keep going? Do I want to keep doing this? And it comes back to one thing, and that is it gives me a lot of meaning in my life. And I think, um, you know, if we have a life without meaning, it's pretty empty. Mm -hmm. And so it gives me a purpose to get out of bed in the morning and uh, 
you know, roll up my sleeves and see what we can create next yeah. and, um, and how we're going to make that happen. Um, Almost every program, I would say, no, every program we've launched here, we've never had any money saved up to do it. We just think, oh, this would wow. be a good thing to do, right? So um, let's do it and we'll see if we can we'll find the resources, we'll right? Yeah. And, you know, it sounds bizarre because the world is a bit paralyzed by fear most of the time mm -hmm. and we get fear mongering through the media. And yet, if you look closely at any business that's achieved a lot, at any entrepreneur who's invented or made something they never start out with the money yeah right the Wright brothers out. didn't have money no, it's they were they had no money and, yeah. and there was another guy being funded to make an airplane and the Wright brothers did it right so i think it's it's uh, yeah just going back to your original question i think uh it's been very interesting for me as someone who was trained to be a concert pianist to be a racehorse, you know, um, achieving for myself in my career, to broaden out and look at things a little more um, around that idea of life journey. We're not here forever. Uh, what do I want to experience? What do I want to create? Um, who do I want to hang out with? Right? Yep. It's it's. Uh, when I picked up Buffy St. Marie the first time in Toronto in 2005, it was a friend of mine said, you should get Buffy St. Marie. And I said, well, who's that? Yeah. Right? So segue forward, she's been here probably, oh, I don't know, nine, 10 times or more. We're, we're likely to bring her back again this year. Mm -hmm. um, like one of the greatest performers of all time, right? Grammy winning, Academy Award winning, yeah. blah, blah, blah. She married myself and my husband, right? Oh, wow. So it's, uh, we've gone to visit her in Kauai. It, this would never have happened without yeah. stepping outside of a level of comfort that I had of a predictable career mm -hmm. that was going well, right? And, you know, I, I, as a classical musician, saved up enough money to buy Aeolian Hall. That doesn't happen too much in Canada, no, right? Yeah. Uh, but I was willing to risk it because something was really missing. And that was, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't know it for a few years, actually, mm -hmm. after I bought the place. It was this idea of interdependence, community, uh, meaning. Right, so so I'd say that's probably the best part about it. Well, it's, I think that's an awesome answer, and it's it, it's great that you found something so meaningful in something that you just took a leap into. And like you said, that nothing. A lot of people that make these um, great discoveries within themselves and life, and or the Wright brothers you're talking about, they're always taking a leap into something or taking a risk, and not necessarily going into it knowing um, that this is going to be. Um, Secure. There's not not a lot of security around it, and it's amazing that there's no such thing as it, security. Yeah, there's no such thing as uh, risk. Like, we'll feel it because we're ingrained for it, but um, we're all gonna die, yeah. right? Yeah. So you can't play it safe and not die. It's, yeah, gonna, it's happen, gonna happen, right? Yeah. So you know, you lose everything in this life. You like, let's say you fail, because I could still fail. Mm -hmm. You could fail. Mm -hmm. Anybody can fail. And so what? I mean, you're still alive, so you pick up the pieces and you try something yeah, again, absolutely. right? I mean, that's the worst case outcome of it all. Um, but in the meantime, you know, live fully. And um, I'm talking to myself a lot when I say <laughs> this, because I have to convince myself every single day to be courageous and to, and to try, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's not the easiest thing when you, my, my parents were, you know, post-depression parents. Yeah. So it's like, oh, when I bought this place, here's the story for you. So I'm, I'm about to show my parents Aeolian Hall. I'm selling my house, mom and dad, and I'm gonna buy this concert hall. So imagine your mom yeah. at the stage door, right? Flinging herself across it like this saying, don't no. do it. <laughs> <laughs> I remember it so vividly. And, um, and now of course she's very proud yeah. and you know, thinks it was a great thing. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, we have to learn to walk around those, those fears. Yeah, right? absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's amazing. Um, kind of switching gears here, I guess. And we were located here in Old East Village, right on, uh, right on Dundas Street. Yeah. Um, so as you've kind of mentioned, you're pretty involved in the community with whether it be volunteers or working with uh, other businesses uh, that in the area. So uh, what would you say would be one of your, your, some of your favorite things about, uh, about the community? It's people rich. Yeah. 
So there's remarkable people here doing remarkable things. I call there's a there's a team of energy workers I would call them too that are trying to uh, clear the bad energy and and try to uh, to work towards a better one. Um, I love the restaurants. Yeah, I love them. Like unique food attitudes. Um, Yam at Momo's, uh, even this Chinese restaurant, I don't know if you've eaten there before, but it's really authentic yeah. Chinese food. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, I think it's still called Spring, right? Spring, yeah, yeah. I, I believe yeah. so, yeah. And then the market, yeah. like this market, and then of course uh, the food incubator market. Uh, the root cellar, of course, uh, yeah. has really fantastic food. And um, we have our dumpling lady down yeah. here as well. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> inviting. Really so all of those, um, the food, I, I'm sure I've left somebody out. There's a Jamaican place here, a uh, uh, Caribbean place uh, that does really good jerk chicken. And um, yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to leave somebody out. Sorry about that, people. Um, <laughs> There's too many to mention. Yeah, them all, but. and um, I love what's happened in the residential area with um, you know the kind of community that's formed over the years. People walk their dogs and know each other and say hi. Um, it's really truly grown into this old-fashioned, yeah, neighborhood, um, which is rare in the city of London and many mm -hmm. other cities, right? Absolutely. Because most people, they go to the mall and they go to their job and they go to their basement computers and they don't even know their neighbors, right? Yeah. It's so, and I think it's a fundamental human need to live in, in community. So that's another piece. Um, I love the fact that we have opportunity here. Yeah. You know, if you want to live in a neighborhood that has opportunity, this is it. Um, the housing is still affordable, although it's growing, you know, yeah. in, in cost. But um, there's there's things that need to be made and done here that haven't been made and done yet, yeah. right? Um, so, like, I could not have bought a performing arts center in Toronto. No, you know, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you could do it here. Yeah. And um, yeah, so there's lots of opportunity for people to move to this neighborhood and to to create wonderful things things and um, you know use their imagination and vision for that so yeah those are the things that really yeah the, the future the the dreaming that's going on it's great yeah and I, I think that those are all just amazing points for the community and, and some that are maybe overlooked by a lot of people that um, whether they live in the community or not um, that they maybe not realize that they, it's so such a close-knit community here that um, you know your neighbors, you know the, the business owners, you know everybody if you're walking down the street, which you don't get a lot of areas, uh, especially in today's cities. Um, with, I mean, I moved from the GTA, um, oh, from wow. Mississauga, and I, I love it here so much more because I actually know my neighbors on my street. Hey everyone, thanks for watching, and I hope you liked this video. If you like what you saw, go check out the website, www.parkbench.com slash east London. There you'll find a whole bunch of information about the local area, news, events, and all the local businesses, and you can check out more great interviews like this. If you know somebody that would like to be featured on this webpage, shoot me a message. I'd love to hear from you. Talk to you later.